Please be seated. We gather here this afternoon, this morning, to remember and celebrate the life of Bill Flynn, one dearly loved and now with our loving God. We come to give thanks for his amazing life and to let go of our grief and pain in the presence of this gathered community, both online as well as here on the South Lawn. I'm Jonathan Morgan, Senior Minister of First Congregational Church and Peggy and Bill's pastor. And I welcome you to the service of loving remembrance. On behalf of Peggy and Bill's family, I would like to thank you all for being here. Your notes, your phone calls, your presence, both here and online, has brought such comfort to the family and to Peggy. Thank you. A couple of notes about the service. You will notice that there is an, an attendee sheet inside your bulletin. We have this because, well, it's COVID times. And since we don't have a, a book of welcome, this way you can let the family know that you're here. And in case we need to contact you, in case of exposure, we'll have a way to do that. So we ask that you please fill this out and leave it on, in the baskets as you exit the service. There's also a small card in the bulletin that you may use to leave a note for Peggy and the family. Maybe a special memory or a way that Bill touched your heart. And please feel free to leave that in the basket also. You will notice that there's a time in the service when you will have an opportunity to share We'll have a mic that Sherry will bring around to the gathered community. And if you have a memory that you would like to share with this gathered community, please raise your hand. And we ask that you do so with love in your heart for all the ways that Bill touched your heart. Lastly, although we will not have our customary time of greeting, with the family due to COVID concerns. After the service, we invite anyone who would like to leave a videotaped message for Peggy and the family. We ask that you please gather by the playground over there. I'll be taping anyone who would like to leave a message. We'll put them together on a video and give them to Peggy and the family. That way she can hear them better. And so we invite you after the service, if you would like, to meet by the playground. Friends, we gather now in the protective shelter of God's healing love, free to pour out our grief, as we lift up the life of this remarkable man and celebrate that he is now in the comfort of God's presence. We gather conscious of others who have died in the frailty of our own existence here on earth and how precious life is. Something that Bill knew, he lived his life to its fullest to the very end. We come to comfort and to support one another in our common loss and to hear wonderful memories and words of hope from our faith that will drive away our despair and move us to offer 
thanksgiving for his life. We come to commend to God with thanksgiving the life of Bill as we celebrate the good news that death does not have the last word. For our prayer this morning, I will be using the prayer we use every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. for our men's Bible study. Bill was a faithful member of that group. He loved gathering with the men to share their beliefs, but maybe more than anything, to share in a common bond, to support one another, and to live in Christian love. He dearly loved that group. And so I'll be offering the prayer that we offer every, every morning on Wednesday. Let us pray. Just as the rain may hide the stars and the morning mist may hide the hills, so may the demands of this day hide the constant quiet blessings awaiting our recognition. Let us set aside the thoughts tumbling over us and pull ourselves away from all distractions. Let us be entirely here together now within this gathering of friends, this group filled with extraordinary souls. And may our fellowship this morning and our search for wisdom and understanding bring renewal to all who have entered this time. And may God be made known to those who will benefit from our clear intentions. Amen. shelter of the Lord who abide in his shadow for life. Say to the Lord, my refuge, my God in whom I trust, and he will raise you up on eagles' wings, bear you on the of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. The snare of the fowler will never capture you, and famine will bring you no under his wings, your refuge, his faithfulness, your shield, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you with the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun. And hold you in the palm of his hand. You need not fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Though thousands fall about you, to 
shine like the sun and hold true in the palm of his hand and hold true in the palm of his hand. To begin our time of remembrance, I invite forward Bill and Peggy's son, Wes. Thank you all for being here. Um, today. Really appreciate it. I'm not sure what best words will honor my dad. In the past week, it's been a gift to hear from many of you about my dad through your eyes. And as I cursed him throughout the week for leaving me and our family, I've also been walking miles in his shoes, quite literally. Morning walks, slipping on his shoes to be closer to him. At those times, he would often whisper in my ear a fragment of music, a song of a bird, an inspired thought. So, Dad, I'll do my best. Bill left this physical world on his own terms, wearing not one exercise tracker, but two. University of Michigan sweatbands flanking his wrists, and a green and yellow tie-dye shirt. He had a tennis racket in his hand and was just a stone's throw away, away from his wife, Peggy. And darn it if he wasn't thoughtful, arranging his departure with the same care and detail he put into designing one of his buildings. He started with a solid foundation. He did it all on 4J property. So my mother and I were surrounded by colleagues who knew me well. He had a fabulous supporting staff to assist. His tennis buddies, a 4J custodian extraordinaire, and EPD representatives that were thoughtful and helpful and listened to a family in shock. And the color scheme was just to his liking, tennis court green. He loved his wife, Peggy, and his family, tennis, architecture, and of course, the art of philosophical discourse. Family meant the world to my dad. Maybe it was because he grew up moving a lot due to his father's work. He attended four different high schools in four different states. He became adept at meeting new friends. He was amiable and really enjoyed hearing about others and treated all with whom he came in contact with respect. And when he went to University of Michigan and found himself in the same place for five years, he was in heaven. And those deep feelings of connection, love, and care became the underpinnings of creating a family of his own with his wife, Peggy, of 61 years. His dedication to his wife and children was an example of the art of love and care. And then there was tennis. As a kid, I could never beat him. And I don't remember winning a single game until I was well into my 20s. The ball always looked like it was coming right to me. And then the bounce happened. And somehow the ball was just out of reach. Slicing off at a rakish angle one way or the other, I couldn't figure out which way it was going to go. Or sometimes it just fizzled with a wicked backspin and actually bounced in reverse. I know there may be a few of you out here today that could have experienced this and possibly come out wondering, how could it be this 90-year-old guy just kicked my butt again? 
He lived, breathed, and dreamed to play in nationals at the master's category when he turned 95. And as Pastor Morgan so aptly said last Sunday, he's probably giving St. Peter a run for his money with his racket as we speak. You know, I remember asking my dad when he knew he wanted to be an architect. And he said without missing a beat, oh, about eight years old. Form and function was his life's work. Making better spaces for all, appealing to the eye, yet utilitarian. And his architectural firm pushed the limits of current practice, putting a canvas dome over a swimming pool for year-round use using styrofoam and sconced in plaster to create an insulation system outside the structure to conserve space for inside areas where it counted. Doing things that hadn't been common practice in the industry, like construction management, to take the place of a general contractor. He loved and lived in that sweet spot of innovation and creativity. And we moved to Oregon to be near family he could have easily slipped into retirement as he was 76 years old. But instead, he put his mind to practicing architecture in Oregon. And this may not seem like a big deal, but the architect registration exam in Oregon, the ARE, is as grueling as it gets. It's a challenging exam with an average pass rate of 67%. It's broken into seven exams and takes about 34 hours to complete. And of course, in Bill's style, he kibitzed with his fellow test takers, and they all got to know him. Most of them young upstarts in the profession, many of them in their 20s. And the results came out. They gave him a standing ovation. He passed it in the first go. So who was Bill Flynn? Last week, when the homily here at First Congregational UCC was about seeing with the eye of the heart, I caught my breath because I felt my dad in that moment because that's where I believe he strived to be and what he strived to do. He was kind and curious and compassionate and gentle and loving. He had the ability to be present with those around him and to listen to their stories and hear them, the ability to see with the eye of the heart. And throughout this week, I poured through his messages and endless scribbled notes and quotes. I saw his texts and emails, messages from a Hyundai dealer in Bend, a master gardener from the OSU Extension Service, Five different roofers with as many refinancing and loan documents and quotes, doctor's appointments for my mom, tennis dates multiple times a week, the geek squad, and the words unexpected and random came to mind, just like his death. And nearly simultaneously, I was inspired to turn to a daily devotional called The Book of Awakening by poet and philosopher Mark Nepo. I looked up August 10th, the day of his death. Sure enough, it was titled at random. At random. Random is the instant a horse at full speed has all four hooves off the ground. This is the original meaning of the word. It refers to the mystery of unbridled passion to the lift that results from total immersion and surrender. In our age, however, random means without design, method, or purpose. It refers to utter chance. It helps us dismiss whatever appears to be beyond the control of our will. If we didn't author it, it must be accidental. Yet our lives are full, are full of unexpected surges of kindness that seem to come from nowhere. Just when you're thirsty, a cup is gathered and passed around. Just when you're lonely to the point of snapping that bone way inside you that you show no one, someone offers you a ride or steadies the grocery bag about to drop from your grip. 
So what might we learn from the horse at random? Consider how all of its energy and desire mounts from the brief moment it inhabits, it inhabits itself fully. And in that moment, it flies only to touch down again and to fly again and to touch, and to touch down again. And for us, the moment at random is the moment of holding nothing back, of giving our all to whatever situation is before us. In that charged moment, we come as close to flying as human beings can. We soar briefly with a passion for life that brings everything within us to meet our daily world. And that's what I, that's what I saw my dad do for me. Bill, grandpa, dad was the person who offered me a ride when I was at that point of that bone snapping. And in the past week, I've heard many things about you, from you about my dad. I heard things like everyone's favorite dad. He was a wonderful man. He was always so kind to me and the kids and I'm forever grateful for that. He was such a great guy, and I always enjoyed visiting with him at church every week. And his kindness was radiant, and he had a gift for making friends with so many people around him. And now I know that he's on love's grand adventure. Dad, this world will not be the same without you. I love you. I'd like to invite forward Ben. <clears throat> Good morning. <clears throat> when I think of my grandpa, I think of playful, energetic, intentional. And he always had a can-do mentality. But, but uh, above all, how I describe him is a family man. In his early years, he served in the Air Force. He was an architect and designed, designed many, uh, many, many beautiful buildings. He raised three amazing kids, Barbara, Wesley, and Peter. But a lot of that was before I personally knew him. <laughs> what I remember is climbing all over him put my fingers in his eyes and his mouth and laughing and asking for more. I remember visiting grandma and grandpa in Lakewood, Ohio, in their house, and each time in the summer finding a new experience, whether it was playing Lake Erie or taking the small hatchet and chopping wood in the backyard and in the garden, he always had a way of making everything seem so amazing and so new and exciting when I was around him. As I grew up and became older, became a firefighter, a paramedic, and he'd always excited to hear about what the next story I had. And I remember telling him about the first time I got to use paddles to shock someone back to life. And he was tentatively lis listening to everything I had to say, and in a few Weeks later, I get a, a package in the mail, and it's a character of myself shocking some poor guy with these paddles, and uh, always had a way of bringing levity to the situation. 
he constantly ins inspired us to uh, get together with family reunions. One in particular in Shasta, he was 88 years old and was determined to get up on the skis. And we were debating whether we were, that was a good idea or not, but sure enough, he was not gonna take no for an answer. He hops up on the skis like he's done, been doing it for his entire life and showed us all how it's done. <laughs> Um, and then as the years have gone by, he's been at my wedding and my sister's wedding, and somehow grandma and grandpa always seem to win the longest married, 61 years, if you're counting, and to watch them lovingly hold each other's hand everywhere they go. Now, whether that was just to keep grandma from falling or a sign of their true love is truly inspiration. And then watching them dance into the night on their special song, something that really inspired me as a husband, as a father, a brother and son. Every time he'd come over, he came in with his tennis rackets and would ask where the closest tennis court was. And no matter what, your skill level was he had a way of bringing you, getting you to the tennis court and uh, making you feel like you're the best tennis player in the world. Is uh, something that always impressed, impressed me. This last time that he uh, came out to visit, one of his things he always was asking was, do you have any projects, you need anything done? And I always tell him no, but he'd still seem to find those projects. But the one thing I did notice and it was inspiring to me was he had a way of turning, we repainted a French store and he had a way of getting all the family involved and we're all sitting around chipping away the paint and sanding this down and turning these small moments into family bonding moments. So to me, Grandpa was more than just someone that served the country and built amazing buildings and raised three amazing children. He was someone that was playful, energetic, intentional, and always enthusiastic about what he did. He's compassionate and inspired me to be a better man, husband, father, son, and brother. And I think everyone here could have, has a similar story and similar experiences, and I, they'll be very missed. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I'd like to invite Amy forward. harder than I thought. Um, Dad's lifelong affair with tennis um, is a perfect metaphor, I think, for the way he moved through his life. He took what came across the net, found the sweet spot from which to receive it, and he responded with grace and strength and style. Um, I first saw this when I met him 25 years ago. Um, he had driven west to New York City to drop him off for grad school. They arrived in Dad's beloved Bannigan. Um, he double parked in front of Wes's building in January in the slush in New York. And we ran a relay of sorts up to Wes's apartment in pairs so the Bannigan was never left by itself. When we were finished, we wanted to grab some dinner, but Dad didn't want to park the Vanigan on the street might be damaged there. 
Parking was a bit of a nightmare in the city and there were no apps to help us back then. So we began driving around the neighborhood looking for a parking garage. It wasn't long before we saw a car turning into one. So we followed it down into the dark. But something seemed a little off about that garage. <clears throat> and we soon realized that we seemed to have found our way into an NYPD parking garage where we should not have been. Um, we couldn't just drive back out because we needed some sort of a card or code or something um, to get out. So we sat, waiting for someone to leave. Back then, it was still possible to be unobtrusive, even in an out-of-state Vanagon. So when a car finally passed by, we followed it. The car exited, and even though we weren't that far behind, the gate began to descend before we were all the way out. I think I remember yes welling, go, 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 go. Uh, Dad was shouting, maybe he was even whooping. He punched it, uh, but not before the steel gate scraped along the back of the roof. Um, I can only imagine how that van looked when we shot out of the garage and onto the street. Somehow we managed to do it without hitting anyone or anything. Um, it's funny, I, I don't remember where we ultimately parked. I don't remember what the roof looked like, if we even got out to see the damage. I don't remember the restaurant. I don't remember the meal. Um, those are many of the details that have fallen away into the darker corners of my memory. But what I do remember vividly is walking down Amsterdam Avenue in the cold winter air beside Dad, who had barely known me for a few hours but it was that easy way he put his arm through mine and with that smile of his said, now tell me about this young woman who left, who Wesley left Seattle and moved all the way across the country to join. The city served him up a somewhat chaotic welcome, but he pivoted. He returned a measure of such warmth that I can still feel it these 25 years later. And that was just dad. He had a way of being completely present, of really seeing you, listening to you, knowing what was important, and helping you see the magic in ordinary moments. Another one of those moments for me was the first time we played charades with him at Christmas time. Now, he claimed he had never played charades before, but I was skeptical because his mother used to downplay her skill at bridge and then absolutely and ruthlessly crush you. So nonetheless, we explained the rules to him. He asked for clarification, stalling, I think. And once he drew his first card to act out his clue, it was painfully obvious that perhaps he had never played charades before. It was not in his skill set. Um, oh, he was terrible. If it had been Pictionary, he would have crushed it. But the acting without talking thing, not for him. Um, he tried to use gestures, but then he kept talking, and someone would shout, you can't talk, and he would clap his hand over his mouth, and then he would regather himself, and he would try again. We would laugh, he would laugh, he would try to gesture, he would talk, we would say no talking, on and on and on it went. Um, I think he knew it was never going to end. We were never going to guess what he was acting out. We were all howling. I think it was the first time I'd ever seen him not able to do something, maybe the only time. Um, but then he pulled out his A game. In uh, the same graceful way that he might have returned a ball on the court that seemed just beyond his reach, he got a little twinkle in his eye. He pretended to yawn dramatically, trying to distract the other team, I think, and then he pointed directly at the Christmas cards, and the kids yelled, Christmas cards! And he said, yay, you got it! Uh, beaming. Uh, there was a good deal of protests, some eye rolling, talk about broken rules, um, but dad hadn't broken any rules, really. The object of his game was always to have the most fun. So on that count, he definitely won. What always made dad happy, most happy were those moments, being with those he loved, with joy planted firmly at the center. Whether he was discovering a new restaurant with mom and inevitably a new dessert, playing tennis, sipping a coffee milkshake in Washburn Park, spending time with his church family, skiing on Lake Shasta, or even pulling weeds with his grandchildren. He was always right smack in the middle of a circle of laughter and joy. And if it didn't start out that way, he made it that way. His face, his eyes, his whole being was always smiling. We can all bring to mind Dad's ability to bring laughter and warmth to almost any situation, to turn even the toughest moments into opportunities to find the brighter side. I know we all have stories of something he said or did that brought a wave of joy over us. 
because dad truly walked every day, every moment in grace and joy and wonder. We've all been talking over the past week about how fitting it was that dad took leave of this world as he was playing the game he loved and so near to the woman he loved so deeply and for so long. <laughs> and while it's painful to be here without him, maybe we can take a cue from him, take what comes at us from the other side of the net, pivot and respond with grace and joy. And if we're lucky, at least half the style that he had. I am the resurrection, I am eternal life, all who believe in me will never die, I am the resurrection, eternal At this time, we invite you to offer a memory, a story about Bill, 
And I'd like to have uh, our good friend, Dick Clark, be the first. I believe, Dick, you were perhaps one of his last tennis victims, if I understand it correctly. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Dick is coming up here. Sherry has a microphone for others. But thank you. Come on up if you would like to use this one. I wasn't aware that I had shared the reality of that last comment with Jonathan. But 10 days ago was my last game with Bill. But for the last decade plus, as a member of the choir of this building, I watched a demonstration of love, commitment, consideration, thoughtfulness as I watched Bill and Peggy coming down the east aisle of this sanctuary, hand in hand, slowly greeting friends, people, and introducing themselves to people they didn't recognize. Every week this happened. And in between those times, I encountered Bill. I went over, more often than not, to the YMC Tennis Center, walked in, and there were two kind of paths a person could take. They could go and be a partner to Bill on one side of the net. It's obvious what the other is. You would be on the other side of the net from Bill. Playing with Bill was another lesson in wisdom, kindness, thoughtfulness, patience, especially playing with me. However, the other side, when he was there, was a lesson in intense humility, basically being that regardless of what you might have learned at the university, on the tennis court, life lessons, the rules of physics did not apply when a small yellow fuzzy ball left the racket of Bill Flynn and hit the ground or your racket. They didn't apply. That's been my marvelous experience with Bill Flynn. I feel blessed that 10 days ago, we played tennis together. In the future, there are going to be a lot of tennis rosters with a significant vacancy on them. But there are a lot of hearts and minds that will be warmer because of our encounter with this marvelous man, Bill Flynn. Thank you, Dick. Looks like we have someone else that would like to share a story. Thank you. I want to give my condolences to Bill's family. This is a very, very difficult time for them, and, and I, I wish you all, all well. Um, Bill, I've known Bill since uh, 2005 or six, and played tennis with him intermittently on and off all those years. And Dick Clark is right about the frustration level that you would have with this man, especially when he did his little slices and his little drop shots, and you just come apart. <laughs> He's truly a master at that. Um, I had the honor and the privilege of being, Bill was my uh, partner when he passed away on the tennis court. We were playing doubles, and um, he was my partner. We were warming up, and I needn't go into details what happened, but uh, he passed away on the tennis court, uh, and it was quite a shock. It was, I was in shock for two or three days afterwards. I just can't and I never will get Bill's image out of my head, ever. But um, one thing I did do, and I'm glad I did, I was driving home after the his passing, and um, in shock and mumbling to myself, and, and I said, oh boy, what am I going to do? Just this awful feeling. So I decided it was on a, I think it was a Thursday, and I decided that Bill and I, he in spirit of course, were going to go play fun and fitness at noon. And he had passed away around 9 a.m., and so he and I went and played tennis together. 
not as opponents, but as friends. And he had a great time, and I did too. Thank you, Bill, for your presence in my life. I, okay, I'll stand. Um, it's my Uncle Bill. Um, I am Kate, and I am Peggy's niece. My, she's my mom's sister. And my Uncle Bill, as I, I what Amy kind of said, his grace and presence and warmth and love was always wonderful. Don't want to diss my other uncles, but he was my favorite. <sighs> At my mom's funeral, my mom passed two years ago, and um, he came up and spoke at my mom's funeral, and he said a time when he sat on a bench with my mom when he was having a rough time, and he felt just being with her and just being in her calmness and accepting and her love made the world of difference to him, and that's how I feel about my Uncle Bill, because that's how I always felt, especially non-judgmentalness about anything and he always wanted to make everything fun and he always wanted to know how you were and what you were doing in your life and he always cared. Well since my mom's passing I have reached out to my aunt and called her every Thursday. She's my most direct connection to my mom and so he would answer the phone and I think I actually had more interactions with him because we didn't live close to each other since, since that time and he would answer the phone, and he'd be like, oh, it's, it's 4 o'clock. It's Thursday. You're calling. He said, let me get my lovely bride. After 61 years, he re always referred to her as his lovely or beautiful bride. And he wouldn't talk to me on the phone because he knew that was our girl time. So he would go and get her. And the last time that we had this happen where I called, my aunt was talking to me and she said, oh, I've got to yell for Bill because there is a squirrel that is climbing up the side of the house and he never has believed me that there, this happens. <laughs> now I've got to give you some backstory on the squirrel. Okay, so apparently they had gone to the nursery and got these impatience plants that they were, it was the end of the season, they were practically free and he wanted to plant them. I find it ironic that he didn't wait for Wes to plant the plants, and they were called impatience. <laughs> he decided to do it by himself, and when he did, he was apparently using some sort of auger, and he clipped his leg, and he cut himself badly. So, but he got them planted, and then this squirrel came and ate all the tops off the impatient plants, all the blooms, and he was mad. So when she called to him to say the squirrel is up the side, apparently she goes, okay, I can see him. He's got the BB gun. He's opening the window, a play-by-play. -play. Oh, the BB's jammed. He didn't get a shot off. He's closing the window. They'll live another day. <laughs> so that's my last memory of my dear uncle I wanted to share with you. I just wanted to get down here where I can see Peggy. Um, I, I, if, if you have not done the dinners for eight at this church, it's a really cool way to get to know eight people for the once a month dinner. And the first five times when I first joined the church, um, Peggy, you and Bill were in my dinners for eight group. And after the third time, I'm thinking, am I just not getting it? They have to keep training me. But with your desserts and Bill 
explained a lot about what this church was all about to me, which was very helpful. I am forever grateful that we got to have our times together uh, once a month with dinner. First of all, my sincere condolences to your family. We will always miss Bill. He is such a gentleman, so positive and, and just wonderful in so many ways. I do want to tell all of you who may not know the really colorful grasses that are on the south side of the sidewalk as you enter or leave here are thanks to Bill and Peggy. They planted those. And let me tell you, I've done enough gardening around this place to know that, that the, it, that's not an easy thing to do, to dig into the ground and uh, to prepare every one of those um, spots where those grasses have just flourished. And actually, a few weeks ago, um, I can't remember exactly about the service, but there was a, um, um, a comparison made to first, um, I'm sorry, um, anyway, there was a, a Bill uh, stood up and talked about how when we're first maybe acquainted or getting together, um, we, you know, sort of keep in our own little spaces and then as we grow and and we reach out and extend ourselves um, sort of in the way that the grasses have done you know at first they were just little clumps and they stuck to themselves well now they're all blending together and just making a, our entry so much prettier and I really I will always always be appreciative of the beauty and the energy <laughs> that it took. And of course, they had to come and water them for quite a while before those plants could survive on their own. But um, that, that was such an act of love. And uh, I just will always appreciate that. And, um, and everything else that Peggy and Bill stood for, we, he truly will be missed. My chair has sunk so far into the ground, I don't know that I can get up. Let's see. Ah, there we go. I just, um, Peggy and family, I loved your father so much, your husband, your grandfather. Um, I just wanted to say the last conversation I had with Bill and Peggy, um, it was one of those very hot Sundays that we've experienced over and over again. And... Um, they were sitting right over there under the, under the shade. And so I went up to them because they were always, they were just three rows behind me whenever I, when we were in um, church together. And we've always chatted and always asked me how my girls are. And anyway, I said, well, Bill, what's going on? And he said, oh, everything's just fine. He said, but I need some help with, my, uh, with deadheading my roadies. And I said, okay, Bill. He had no idea that I don't know a thing about gardening. <laughs> um, and I said, okay, when it's not 90 degrees, I will come and deadhead your roadies. He said, well, you might get lunch out of it. I said, well, why do you think I'm coming? Um, it, it was just such a sweet, sweet memory of he. And here's his wonderful, beautiful bride. And I will never forget it. And Peggy, I will come and deadhead your roadies if you know, if it's necessary. And you don't have to feed me lunch.
Thank you for those memories. Sixty-one years. That's kind of hard to fathom. And yet every week that you and Bill would come to church, both on Sunday morning and when you would do your quilting and he'd go off to play tennis, what I experienced in your relationship was the true meaning of love. It was so touching to see you together. And as Wes started off with saying regarding Bill, he was, a, he was like a father to many of us. I think I told that, that to Wes and the family when we gathered on the day he died. He was kind of an ideal dad, gentle, kind, loving, supportive, somebody you would want by your side. And so I am so glad that you were by his side every moment of those 61 years because you, you were the sunshine of his life. my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. As I lay sleeping, I dreamed I held you in my arms. When I awoke, dear, I was mistaken. So I hung my head and I cried. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy. Never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. now may God bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up the light of everlasting grace upon you and give you peace. Amen.